So recently at uh, one of our training programs in the Toronto Psychoanalytic Society, I've been teaching a course entitled Interpersonal, Culturistic and Relational Approaches in Psychoanalysis, uh, covering theorists like Harry Stack Sullivan, Eric Fromm, Karen Horney, and uh, more recent relationalists like Stephen Mitchell, and uh, to some extent the so-called intersubjectivist tradition of uh, Stollero, Atwood, Branshaft, uh, Jessica Benjamin, uh, all of these relational and intersubjective thinkers. And uh, in the course of uh, this teaching, uh, the question came up as to where I personally stand. Am I a relationalist? Am I a traditionalist? Uh, where do I stand in terms of this debate? So, uh, in order to describe my own thinking in this area, I came up with uh, the following chart. I hope if I hold it up, you're able to see it adequately. Okay. So we have a triangle, which already suggests dialectical thinking. Um, my new book is called Psychoanalytic Thinking, a Dialectical Critique of Contemporary Theory and Practice. Uh, dialectical thinking is evolutionary thinking. It's always an attempt to get to the third thing beyond the either or. And so at the very bottom of this chart, we have the either or. Nature on the one side, nurture on the other. Uh, with the nature position comes biologism in psychoanalysis and what I have called the under-socialized concept of man. And I think that uh, while I'm going to argue that no psychoanalytic theorist embraced, uh, embraces either of these two extreme positions, pure nature, pure nurture, on the nurture side we have culturalism, and we have what my colleague Dennis Wrong has called the over-socialized concept of man, most psychoanalytic theorists are somewhere on the what Freud called the complemental series, the continuum between these two extreme positions. A pure biologism is really not evident, even in Freud. A pure culturalism is equally absurd, although one comes pretty close to that absurdity in the thought of Michel Foucault and other extreme cultural relativists. Uh, most sensible thinkers embrace both nature and nurture, of course. That's position three. So one is nature, two is nurture, three is both and, and most sensible theorists are in the both and position. However, some lean more towards uh, biologistic, uh, bi biological factors, and others lean more towards social, cultural, and interpersonal factors in shaping human personality and psychopathology. Um, Freud obviously has a large biologistic element. Even when we correct for um, the mistranslation of his term trieb, uh, mistranslated by the word instinct by James Strachey when Strachey really should have used the term drive and a lot of people want to blame um, the view of Freud as a biological reductionist entirely on Strachey which is unfair because um, even if we translate Treb properly by the term drive Freud makes it very clear that the drive is composed of four elements, an aim, an object, a pressure, and a source. And uh, he indicates that the human drive 
differs from the animal instinct precisely in that its aims and objects are not fixed, they're not pre-programmed or built in, but very much open to social learning, and uh, they can be easily displaced and reversed. Um, so he clearly is describing human drives, not animal instincts, but he insists that the human drive uh, bubbles up from a somatic source. And he does not mean the brain, he means bodily zones. Um, and he describes the human drive as uh, a concept on the frontier between both mind and body. Uh, the source is a bodily source for Freud. Uh, he's honest enough to admit that he can't pin down what that bodily source is in the case of the aggressive drive, uh, but he suggests vis-a-vis -vis the sexual drive that our sexuality kind of bubbles up from the body, uh, which I've argued is fundamentally incorrect. Human sexuality trickles down from the mind and employs the body as a vehicle. Uh, by the way, one relational thinker, Eric Erickson, in his writing on modes and zones, uh, takes exactly this position that um, the bodily zones are employed as vehicles for varying forms of relatedness. The relatedness comes first and employs the body in particular ways rather than bubbling up from the body. Uh, Erickson, of course, in his very quiet and polite way, nevertheless describes Freud's model of man as a centaur model that mythical beast with the head and torso of a man but the body of a horse. Uh, for Freud, our sociali sociality is, uh, is, is a layer that is superimposed upon our animality. Uh, and Erickson is fundamentally critical of that kind of thinking, uh, that idea that the human problem is somehow a mind-body problem or a culture versus nature uh, problem with superego and ego on the level of the human and id on the level of the beast. Now, Freud does transcend this. In 1920, Beyond the Pleasure Principle, he introduces his final dual drive theory of Eros and Thanatos. Um, and uh, at that point, um, he could have moved beyond his psychobiology um, but he doesn't really do so. Eros and Thanatos, he still insists, have somatic sources. He does not entirely transcend his earlier mind-body dualism. Melanie Klein takes the step of essentially freeing Eros and Thanatos from biological uh, grounding. I mean, she doesn't do so explicitly, but implicitly in Klein's writing, uh, eros simply becomes love and Thanatos becomes hate and the human problem is not seen any longer as a mind-body problem but a love versus hate problem, a conflict in the human heart and the human mind. Um, so Freud leans toward the nature side of the continuum insofar as he posits a biological source of the drives. Um, a thinker like John Bowlby, in a very different way, also leans a little more to the biological uh, in that in attachment theory we are primates, we come into the world with a biologically predetermined need for attachment. Of course, Bowlby also brings in nurture in a big way. Um, to describe how that intrinsic biological need is met or fails to adequately be met by caretakers leading either to secure or insecure attachment, etc. Freud too, of course, was uh, well aware of environmental factors um, shaping uh, the fate of the drives. So all of these thinkers are both and. Uh, certain relational thinkers like Heinz Kohut, lean a little bit more towards the nurture side of the continuum. Um, 
it's the self-object environment, self-object responsiveness is crucial in the shaping of personality and psychopathology, but even for Kohut, uh, he, he specifies the idea of an inborn uh, blueprint uh, for the self, uh, an idea I've found rather questionable, but nevertheless he is positing some kind of uh, innate factor here, so, so he, he remains a both-and thinker, although he tends to fairly heavily emphasize nurture. Um, we get to pretty extreme emphasis on the nurture end of the continuum with Harry Stack Sullivan, although Greenberg and Mitchell tried to defend Sullivan from the charge of producing an over-socialized model of man. Uh, I think uh, their defense really uh, is unconvincing. Uh, he wrote an essay called The Illusion of Personal Individuality. In many places he indicates that mental health is really all about adaptation, successful adaptation to the social environment. This is a long way from the statement attributed to Bertrand Russell that there are some societies in which the only place a decent person can be is in jail. Uh, sometimes health means the opposite of adaptation to society. Um, the point was put famously by R.D. Lang who describes a, a squadron of airplanes and uh, one airplane might well be out of formation but the squadron might be off course and that one plane that's out of formation could possibly be on course. Uh, Sullivan doesn't have much of this uh, kind of awareness that sometimes uh, mental health or personal development uh, requires uh, a kind of rejection of the goal of <clears throat> adaptation um, a kind of maladaptation. Uh, sometimes mental health is maladaptation to the surrounding society when the society has gone off course. Um, okay, Sullivan very much influ uh, emphasizing the influence of significant others, consensual validation, <clears throat> seeing the self pretty much as made up of the reflected appraisals of others. Sullivan is one of the most popular, was one of the most popular psychoanalysts among sociologists, one of the few, socio, uh, one of the few psychoanalysts that sociologists could take seriously, precisely because uh, most sociologists have shared Sullivan's over-socialized concept of man. Someone recently wrote an article with the title something like why are sociologists nature, why do they suffer from nature phobia? The discipline of sociology pretty much grew up uh, as anti-biology and anti-psychology. Famously Durkheim um, describes the field as focusing on social facts, um, uh, certainly not biological and psychological facts. And so the idea of the self as a product of the reflected appraisals of others, uh, that has been a dominant over-socialized view in much of the field of social psychology and sociology, and that is pretty much Sullivan's view, I believe. Although, as I say, Greenberg and Mitchell tried to defend Sullivan from this charge, uh, I think unsuccessfully. So Sullivan and much of sociological social psychology is leaning pretty heavily towards the nurture uh, side of, of the continuum, um, and, and certainly much of post-structuralism following Foucault is a radical kind of culturalism, cultural relativism. Okay, but most psychoanalytic thinkers are somewhere in the both-and uh, territory. But then there's position three at the top of the, um, the triangle, uh, existentialism. And, and what I mean here is the humanistic existentialism of Eric Fromm. Um, 
To be distinguished from the far less humanistic existentialism of Jean-Paul Sartre, I mean, there are many parallels between Sartre and Fromm. Both see the human being as a denatured animal, as experiencing a rupture with nature, with the emergence of human symbolic consciousness. Um, they would certainly agree with Kierkegaard's interpretation of the Genesis myth as uh, eating of the tree, uh, the fruit of the tree of knowledge, representing the emergence of knowledge of symbolic consciousness, of self-awareness. They knew they were naked and fashioned fig leaves to cover themselves. The emergence of shame and guilt with this eruption of self-consciousness. Uh, somewhere around 18 months, two years, the child moves into language, um, self-awareness. Um, and so the human is a symboling animal, a language animal. Um, as Fromm describes the human being, uh, we, we, we are the freaks of nature with one foot inevitably in nature, our bodies binding us. Uh, into the natural world, uh, but with another part of ourselves, our symboling minds, radically transcending nature. And, of course, this is no celebration of the human over the animal. This is no vainglorious uh, speciesism, um, because human uniqueness entails unique destructiveness precisely because we have emerged to a, a large extent from nature um, we destroy our ecosystems we're capable of a kind of destructiveness that no other animal precisely because other animals are instinctually regulated we are minimally instinctually regulated um, because we lack fixed drives uh, we have to receive orientation from society and we have to achieve uh, self-regulation through the choices that we make and therefore we suffer from the anxiety of freedom as Kierkegaard so brilliantly describes and Sartre describes. Um, okay, um, but Sartre's existentialism is very dark, although he says he's describing human relations in a state of bad faith. He never gets around really to describing human relations in the state of good faith. And so he offers, Sartre offers us essentially a pretty sadomasochistic um, vision in which each of us is trying to transcend the transcendence of the other. Each of us is trying to objectify the other and establish ourselves as master. Um, this is a, a description of pathology, of a great deal of pathology, but it really is not much of a picture of health. Uh, Eric Fromm's humanistic existentialism shares Sartre's view of the human being as emerging, uh, emerging into freedom and self-consciousness, and he shares Sartre's view that we seek to escape from freedom. I mean, that's the title of Fromm's first book, and it was about the appeals of both fascist and communist totalitarianism. Human beings long to lay down the burden of freedom uh, under uh, and submit to a master. Uh, Sartre and Fromm share that vision, but Fromm also gives us a vision of, of, of human maturity, and health in which we embrace our freedom instead of seeking to escape from it and um, and and a vision of health as as embodying the achievement of both love and reason now I'm a critic of Fromm in that he calls the healthy orientation a productive one and I believe that it is our very obsession with productivity uh, in both capitalist and socialist forms that uh, has destroyed, is destroying our ecosystems and contributing to uh, ACD, um, anthropogenic climate disruption. Um, I prefer to think of the healthy orientation as a caring orientation rather than a productive one. But my point is that Fromm does, in fact, give us um, 
a pretty good picture of what uh, of what human maturity and health looks like and it's all about love and about truth for Fromm and so he differs from Sartre in in that respect but Fromm gives us what has been called a qualified essentialism um, he does not succumb to a radical culturalism and a radical relativism and he does not succumb to a simplistic biologically determinist form of essentialism uh, he follows Karl Marx uh, who says that um, we have to distinguish uh, human nature in general from human nature as formed by particular historical social and economic conditions uh, so from Marx from takes this qualified essentialism there is a human essence a human nature in general but we only see human nature as shaped by particular social and historical conditions but because there is a human essence Fromm is is able to ask the question as to how well these essential elements of human nature essential human needs for relatedness for meaning for identity for connectedness uh, how are these human needs met how well or poorly are they met by particular societies uh, so he can use his concept of human nature as a criteria for ranking and criticizing particular societies in terms of how much alienation from our essence do they require or to state it the other way around how well or, or poorly do these societies allow us uh, to develop and fulfill our potentials to fulfill ourselves um, and our needs for love, connectedness, and so on. Um, so existentialism represents uh, a fourth position on this chart. Um, it transcends the either-or of nature versus nurture. Um, it's a third thing, and we have a triangle. Uh, the triangle to any psychoanalyst certainly suggests the Oedipal triangle and uh, the triangle is associated with dialectical thought because dialectical thought is always getting beyond thesis and antithesis, antithesis to the third thing, the synthesis. And getting to the third thing is getting to the Oedipal thing and dealing with the Oedipal issue um, getting beyond the dyad into the triad there are also echoes of the Trinity here I think there is a connection between dialectical thought and Trinitarian thought and Oedipal thought getting to the third thing okay so the question comes up am I a relational analyst now, that's a very difficult question to uh, to answer um, but let me make an attempt um, let's talk about the conflict between traditional psychoanalysis on the one hand and relational psychoanalysis on the other and of course I'm going to go dialectical here and say that uh, I seek a third position um, beyond this duality but let's describe the two positions uh, at least on, on on one dimension or a couple of dimensions with traditional psychoanalysis I share a focus on the unconscious which I feel is sometimes lost um, perhaps often lost uh, by people who work in the relational tradition now I must acknowledge that there are many different kinds of relationalists. I mean, uh, the Sullivanians, uh, the interpersonalists distinguish themselves from the self psychologists, and the intersubjectivists distinguish themselves from the self psychologists, and 
the followers of Jessica Benjamin distinguished themselves. So there are many sub-schools within relational psychoanalysis, and one can't uh, overgeneralize. They have their differences. But sometimes the relationalists are so focused on the relationship that they kind of lose the unconscious of the patient. Um, traditional psychoanalysis is very much concerned to help what is unconscious in the patient to become conscious. Now a lot of relationalists immediately think that they associate this focus on attempting to make the patient's unconscious conscious. They associate that with analyst authoritarianism, as if the analyst is sitting there thinking he knows the patient better than the patient can possibly know herself. It does not need to be associated with analyst authoritarianism. The analyst can operate in an extremely egalitarian and democratic way. Instead of telling the patient what her associations really mean, he can do a playback and say, first you came in and talked about the hairdresser putting the sticky stuff on your head, and then you talked about how the people renovating your apartment failed to put up the plastic sheet and that white stuff got all over. And then you talked about the air conditioner repairman coming too late and water dripped all over the floor. What does this mean to you? I, I mean, the, the analyst may have some speculations about what this all is about, but he can simply do the playback. What do you think? And get the patient's associations. That's the proper way of, of, of trying to get at the unconscious discourse beneath the manifest and conscious one. But that project of getting at the unconscious, I believe, with the traditionalists, with the Freudians, with the Kleinians, I believe that that is central uh, to what psychoanalysis uh, is about. I mean, the patient comes into analysis with a mind, a troubled mind, with conflicts that um, they have struggled with, perhaps throughout their lives. They bring that with them into the analytic relationship, and certainly the relationship that develops is important. There can't be an analysis without a working relationship, a working alliance. Um, certainly the analyst's psyche weighs in, but I have trouble with the concept of co-construction. Uh, yeah, the analyst plays a part in the construction of the discourse that emerges, but uh, the focus should be primarily on the patient, uh, not on the analyst. Uh, it's not, uh, the production is not a 50-50 production. I mean, what goes on should be shaped mainly by what the patient is bringing. And the analyst offers some suggestions, uh, some possibilities, some hypotheses. And if they don't make sense to the patient, they go in the garbage can. Maybe they come out of the garbage can in two years and they make sense two years hence. But uh, the point is that uh, the focus really is on the psyche of the patient. Uh, so uh, in terms of trying to analyze defenses, in trying to listen with the third ear, in trying to get at what's unconscious, uh, I'm with the traditionalists. Well, okay, in what sense am I a relational analyst? Uh, I reject the stance that we often find among the traditionalists, especially classical Freudians, classical Kleinians, and certainly Lacanians. I mean the stance in which the analyst tries to be relatively quiet, neutral, uh, non-self-revealing, uh, poker face, blank screen, silent. All of this is justified as creating a space for the patient's 
material, particularly the patient's unconscious, to emerge. Um, I feel that this blank screen poker face uh, abstinent analyst is harmful and has been harmful to many patients. I resonate very much with Donald Winnicott's statement that the analyst should above all remember that the patient is our honored guest. If he needs a drink of water, you go get him a drink of water. If she needs a blanket, you go get her a blanket. It's a human relationship. The attention should mostly be on the patient's psyche, but a relationship emerges. I don't believe it's a co-construction. That implies too much input from the analyst's personality. I mean, I try to be relatively quiet uh, for the first half of the session in order to gather the patient's associations and try to make something uh, of those associations with the patient. Uh, I try not to fill the session, but uh, at times I permit myself to be quite human, um, uh, at times self-revealing. I mean, I try not to use up the patient's time for which the patient is paying by going on and on about myself. Um, but I don't try to hide uh, what I'm thinking or feeling or to hide various aspects of my own life that might be relevant to what the patient is struggling with. Uh, in this way, I'm departing uh, quite significantly from the traditional psychoanalytic stance. In fact, my traditional psychoanalytic colleagues are critical of me uh, for being what they see as excessively self-revealing. Uh, I don't agree with them about this. Um, I try to be a healer and um, I try to use my personality in healing ways. Um, and by healing, I mean um, compassionate, uh, kind, warm. Um, uh, so that, that cold, remote stance of some traditional analysts, and again, I don't want to paint all the relationalists with one brush. I don't want to paint all of the traditionalists with one brush. But one does still encounter this idealization among traditionalists of uh, the quiet, very self-restrained, playing his cards very close to his chest, uh, mirror-like, abstinent analyst. I reject this. I think it's anti-therapeutic. I have no patience for it. I don't find it helpful. With this, in this I'm with the relational people. On the other hand, um, I don't, I mean, I don't go as far as the relationalists do in terms of their theory of, of cure. I mean, there's an interesting difference here between Cohut himself and some of his later followers. I mean, with all of his emphasis on self-object responsiveness, uh, Kohut still adhered to an idea of optimal frustration as central to, as necessary for development, um, both in childhood and in analysis. And he emphasized the role of insight, uh, insight into uh, the consequences of empathic failures, insight into the circumstances in which the patient fragments, uh, the so-called disruption repair cycle, uh, insight into repetitions, repetitive patterns of various kinds. I mean, Kohut thought that insight uh, played a significant role in how analysis cures. Analysis does not cure only by uh, only through a reparative relationship. Insight plays a part. So that's Kohut. But then uh, his followers, many of them, 
pretty much dropped the idea of optimal frustration in favor of what some of them called optimal responsiveness. Um, and increasingly, they came to think of the cure less as insight than uh, a kind of cure through the response in itself. And uh, I just don't agree with that. Uh, I, I think the analyst responsiveness is very important, but equally important is the analyst's knowledge of the way that the unconscious gets encoded. The analyst has knowledge relevant to how to go about decoding messages from the unconscious. Uh, the analyst has an expertise that he brings to bear in the production of insight and self-understanding. And a great deal of what the patient should be taking away from a good analysis is substantially enhanced self-understanding. Uh, and the analyst helps with this because the analyst understands the difference between primary process thinking kind of thinking that goes on in the unconscious and the secondary process thinking of, of everyday life. Um, and the analyst's awareness of the mechanisms of condensation, displacement, plastic representation, symbolism, secondary revision, those uh, processes Freud describes in the dream book. Um, the analyst views every session as a dream. <clears throat> and just as the dream needs decoding, so does the session need decoding. And the decoding is not an authoritarian imposition by the analyst. It's uh, a, a, a process in which the analysand and the analyst work together to decode the manifest content. Uh, but this decoding leads to insight into things that are bothering the patient on deeper levels. Things that a part of the patient does not want to see. Painful truths that the patient may find unbearable and resists. I mean, here again, a lot of the extreme relationalists have thrown out the concept of resistance. <clears throat> Stolaro et al., they think if, 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 if an analyst talks about the patient as resisting, this is no more than the analyst's revealing that he's got a countertransference problem. If he didn't have a countertransference problem, he wouldn't be seeing the patient as resisting, they think. I profoundly disagree. Patients resist pain. We all resist pain, and sometimes the truth is painful, and so patients resist it. And the analyst, over time, is helping them uh, acquire a willingness and an ability to bear the pain entailed in facing the truth. Not a truth defined by the analyst and imposed, but a truth discovered by patient and analyst together through decoding the disguises and gradually and slowly and kindly dismantling the defenses till the patient can see and bear the truth. Now, of course, this is more in line with traditional psychoanalysis. Facing pain, mourning losses. It's not a, a simple pouring of the analyst's healing empathy to fill the cracks in the patient's self. It's not a reparenting process of that sort. It's a discovery, a mutual discovery of what is going on in the hidden depths, uh, the evasion of which is making the patient unhappy depressed, anxious, self-defeating. Uh, we need to bring out what is hidden and what is behind the manifest suffering that brings the patient into analysis in the first place. 
So that's traditional. But with the relationalists, I think in order to do this properly, one has to really get away from this blank screen and this cold neutrality. Uh, one has to acknowledge one is on the side of the truth, one is on the side of health, one is on the side of love versus hate. Um, in other words, there is an ethical element to psychoanalytic practice uh, that can't be evaded. We, we're on the side of conscience which, as I've argued in many places, is quite distinct from superego. We don't want to be superegoish with patients. But on the other hand, we do have a conscience, and we do have a set of ethics. And our practice is an ethical practice. It's guided by these values, truth values, love values. We value kindness over cruelty, um, and we value truth over lies and we value love over hate. Um, and uh, we might as well make this <laughs> explicit because it undergirds our entire practice.